So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, January the 20th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 192. And what you just saw outside is what's going on right now. Ran outside and got that video sequence just for you guys. So I want to welcome you if you've watched me before or if you're new. And if you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description below and see what the topics are going to be. These are all questions that were submitted by people over the last week, viewers and people that follow and uh, through podcasts, which is on Podbean, The Way to Be is the title of the podcast. And thanks for all the truckers that let me know that you listen to me while you're driving. So how cold is it outside? 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That's zero Celsius. The wind speeds are 8.1 miles per hour, continuous with gusts at 12 miles an hour. It's 99% relative humidity. No great surprise there because it's snowing. If you want to know how to put in your own question or suggest a topic for discussion next Friday, please go to thewaytobe.org and click on the page also titled The Way to Be. There's a form there that you can fill it out. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So thanks for being here. Thanks to those who submitted their questions. Some of you submitted questions that don't make it, and that's because they're either very unique to where I don't think a lot of people might be interested, or we've covered it so often that we just don't want to constantly repeat ourselves, unless it's something really important or there's an update to it. Speaking of updates, <clears throat> a lot of people are talking about the vaccination. What vaccination? No, not that vaccination. The vaccination for the queen honeybee. The vaccination is against uh, American fowl brood, which we know causes people to burn up their hives and destroy everything when it's detected in the brood. And usually it happens when you get an inspection. I highly suggest that you personally familiarize yourself with brood issues. There are really good books. I'm going to put some links down in the video description to some resources for you. There are some books called, for example, Honeybees and Their Maladies. This is an area where you really need to know what you're looking at and what might be going wrong in your brood frames. So then the issue comes up, uh, would you get it? Are you going to get it? Well, I don't know uh, how it's going to go or who's going to get it, but they'll be vaccinated queens against American fowl brood. In all the time that I've been doing um, beehive photography and visiting apiaries when I first started out in 2006, I took pictures of several other apiaries. One of them had American fowl brood, and it was brutal because they had to quarantine the apiary so that they could test the other hives, and then they also completely destroyed the hive that had positive tests on American fowl brood because it's not treatable. And that puzzles some people because they'll go, yeah, if you have American fowl brood, these are the treatments. Well, these are the treatments for the hives that are adjacent to the hive that had American fowl brood because we know that bees drift around and spread the wealth when it comes to disease. So but the, the cool thing is, well, the cool thing, I don't know, the, the positive end of that is that I've not seen another case of American fowl brood anywhere. And we get the reports, though, which is one of the benefits of registering your apiary here in the state of Pennsylvania. Did you know that it's the law that you register your apiary? And a lot of people say, well, I don't want the man in my business. But one of the benefits is, for example, if somebody did have American fowl brood and it was detected, and you would be part of that reporting string so that they could reach out to you and the Department of Agriculture could let you know that uh, you know somebody a mile away from you has American fowl brood and it's being dealt with, but that would inspire you to test your hives. But I'm just saying they've done such a good job of controlling it. Haven't seen it around very much, but here's the good side to that. <clears throat> if they have uh, developed a vaccine, then they have a method for developing, delivering, and vaccinating queen bees, which of course you vaccinate the queen, that's, that's the whole colony later. So every egg that she lays will of course be a vaccinated egg. This is not new in agriculture, we do it with chickens. There's the LT vaccine. There are a lot of vaccines that uh, they give to birds that do not defeat the organic rating of your chickens or your eggs. So don't look at it as a monster, look at it as a tool so that your bees can have immunity. And, uh, but you know, the good news is they'll be able, hopefully then, to come up with vaccines for other things. Maybe deformed wing virus. Who knows? 
If they can develop one, they can develop more. And I heard, I can't substantiate it, but the method that they used and the reason that uh, they had the ability to develop that vaccine was because of research that was done when they did vaccinations and developed vaccines for the COVID virus. So kind of interesting the way science comes full circle. I don't know if it's going to change much for backyard beekeepers, but it's interesting to know. The other thing that came out that people are asking about recently is the pollen on sunflowers. And how that may have the ability to do something to reduce Varroa. Now, it wasn't real specific. So the knee-jerk reaction is a bunch of people reach out and say, I'm going to plant sunflowers everywhere because it's going to defeat Varroa mites. Uh, it's kind of collective. This is my take on it. You know, just sitting around, drinking out of my Hive Life coffee cup, thinking about it. What are we going to do? Well, I'm not doing anything different. And that's because <clears throat> it's interesting that the pollen that's coming from sunflowers, and by the way, sunflowers come in a lot of varieties. Uh, the pollen that comes from sunflowers has proven through the years to have a positive impact on hive immunity. So things beyond just the Varroa destructor mite, and I'm not sure how it works on the Varroa destructor mite in their reduction, but... Uh, it doesn't hurt. And here's the thing, because people will look at pollen profiles and the protein, the amino acids and everything else, and whether or not it's a complete pollen protein diet for your honeybees, because they use it to develop their brood. But see, it's not a prime nutrition source for your bees from sunflowers. But if it has other traits that benefit your bees, then there you go. And diverse forage is going to always be key. So would I run out and plant an acre or two of sunflowers? Yeah, because they do it every year. Why? Because it looks good in photography as a background. Plus the bees go on it all the time and not just Apis mellifera, which is our honeybee that we manage, but uh, Melissodes and other native bees go sometimes exclusively to sunflowers. So it doesn't hurt to have them. And uh, I'll just hit on that a little bit more. The things that I look to plant natural diversity, things that look good for people, smell good to bees. Bees can get pollen and nectar from them. In some cases, they only get nectar as a benefit from the flower, depending on what it is. Sometimes they only get pollen from a flower, depending on what it is. Like ragweed, for example, they get pollen from that. Not much, if any, nectar. So on the flip side of that, they get lots of nectar from sunflowers, but not necessarily usable pollen for the brood. So diversity is key, just like with the human diet. You know, you don't want to eat just one thing all the time, no matter how good it might seem to be. Nothing on its own will be complete. And I look for plants that have a long bloom. That's why this year on a big, I'm on a big hyssop thing. So anise hyssop, agastache, and hyssop, see, it's never simple because there are a bunch of other varieties of it. And they're perennial, but guess what? It's a perennial, but it might only last three years. So would it reseed itself? These are the things I think about and deal with. And backyard beekeepers want to do what they can for their bees. So they jump online and order a quarter pound of seed or something, which by the way, would seed a lot. So you could go in collectively as a bee group and then buy a pound of something and then distribute it throughout all your members and everyone could have a quarter acre of something. So the reason I like hyssop and the reason I'm on that right now is because it starts blooming in June and blooms all the way through October and into November. So even after we've had frost and cold weather, the bees still had some forage to go to and I didn't have a lot of it last year and I figured if a little is good, a lot would be better and so I'm planting a bunch more this year and then we're going to look at it to see which ones the bees go at the most. So it's going to be interesting. Let's jump right into our first question now that I've wasted all that time talking about things. <clears throat> question number one comes from Michelle in Detroit, Michigan. Do you still think powdered sugar mite tests are worth doing or do they underestimate the varroa counts too drastically? Would you have to get less than 1% in order to trust your sugar test? Thank you. Okay, so here's the thing. And for years I've done sugar shakes. I'm also looking more at bottom board uh, droppings when it comes to the Varroa destructor mite. And uh, could we say that the sugar shake method, and those of you that don't understand what I'm talking about, what do you mean sugar shake? Well, 
you collect your beads in these containers and then we have to we have a couple of options one is to add powdered sugar to it I had a powdered sugar container over here that had a screen top on it so that you could put the bees 300 bees is the magic number but it's give or take put 300 bees in a container usually uh, for the sugar shake it's just a quart mason jar it's got a screen lid that goes on it so you put your 300 bees in there put the lid on and then you add two tablespoons of powdered sugar into that give it a little dusting and then you set them in the shade for a while so the reason i mentioned that is a lot of people that do the powdered sugar shakes, including, by the way, our state inspectors here in Pennsylvania, uh, they forget that part. In other words, they put powdered sugar in there, the bees get all covered in it, and they go right to shaking, and then they shake it out through their screen top. You can make your own, like that's number eight screen. Yes, mites go right through it. And uh, <clears throat> you can even take a mason jar like this one. This is a pint. You can take this metal piece out of the middle and you can cut your own circle with number nine stainless steel and then you put it right there and then you'll be able to shake it out onto, in my case, a coffee filter, a large coffee filter. And then use fresh water and I wash the sugar through and what's left, a nice white coffee filter contrast and I have those little amber colored, little root beer colored Barrow Destructor mites so that I can count them. But the key is, after you put the two tablespoons of sugar in on the mites, you have to park it in the shade somewhere and let them get upset about it and let them sit in there because they start grooming. Not only do they start grooming, they heat up their body temperature. So their little thoraxes heat up. And this is something that I've always wanted to make a video about and I get busy doing other things and I don't demonstrate it. But so we want them to go through that self-grooming phase where they get excited, they raise their body temperature, and they're doing all of these things because they're distressed about being put in that container, or in this case, a pint mason jar. And uh, then they're grooming off the mites, and the mites are losing their foothold. Mites are not really good at holding on to the bees. But if you don't follow the steps and give them that dwell time so that the bees can groom themselves, so the mites can become annoyed, and the mites can become dislodged, then you do get a much lower or less effective count. Now, even if you do it perfectly, is that method of counting mites as good as using, in this case, Dawn Ultra free and clear instead of alcohol wash? I recommend this because environmentally uh, superior. And the other thing is that was proven to not only dislodge the mites quicker, even without agitation, based on Randy Oliver's research at Scientific Beekeeping, um, but also, sometimes with an alcohol wash and they shook out the mites, the mites even crawled away, which is okay for me because this year I want to collect live mites. So what does the sugar shake do for me? So I'm sorry if I'm muddying the water here a little bit. But the sugar shake is going to leave me with live mites that I can put into Petri dishes and I can get more observation on those little rascals. And I know a lot of you are feeling bad for them being put in those dishes and not killed right away, that they'll be wandering around blind because they have no eyes looking for somewhere to be. And uh, it's not going to happen. <clears throat> so what's the percentage of inaccuracy? It depends on who's doing that test. So the alcohol wash, Dawn Ultra Free and Clear, or the powder, powdered sugar shake. If I get two or three mites on a powdered sugar shake, right, of 300 bees. Am I going to treat the colony for mites? Here's what I personally am going to do. I'm not going to treat if I just get one to three on a sugar shake, but I want to see if they progress. So in other words, two weeks down the road, I do another sugar shake on the same colony. Now I have six or seven mites treatment level. Does that mean that, uh, as the question is here for Michelle, um, do I have to get less than 1% in order to trust a sugar test? So I would say no, because the state inspectors here, and I consider them the authorities on testing. Why? Because they do so much of it. They do hundreds of tests every week. And uh, they see the results, and they collect data, and they know uh, what the mite loads are in different apiaries, and they see them rise and fall. And so your state inspectors, if you happen to be registered, and if you happen to get inspected, become a great resource for statistics on 
what things are working and what things are not and what would I expect in June if I got a three mite count with a sugar shake, what would be happening by July. So at the time when your colonies are building and everything else, it all comes into play. Would you treat? So if I had three or more, that's a treatment threshold. If I had two, wow, we're just one off. Would I treat or not? That's going to be your own judgment call. Uh, because then with the alcohol wash, if we did both, what was the count that we got in comparison to sugar? So if I got two or three with the alcohol wash, not to mention the fact that we didn't have to kill those nurse bees, and not to mention the fact that when you use a sugar shake, if you're like some people I know whose name will not be mentioned, if you accidentally put your queen into your mite count container, and you use sugar shake, you've got a queen that got dusted and annoyed by sugar. And when you put them back in the hive, they're not dead, neither is the queen. However, this person did the alcohol wash and guess who was in the middle of it? The queen. So that's the other end of it. If you, I mean, most people can pick out their queen. I don't mean to alarm you and say, hey, don't ever do it if that's what you want to do. But the accuracy for me is not enough more. Uh, to justify using the uh, alcohol or ultra free and clear uh, instead of using just dry sugar. So dry sugar works for me. Now, in the past, I have done uh, the Dawn wash. I did it when I noticed the colony had brood disease. <clears throat> so it was the Long Langstroth hive. The video is up. Uh, I show how to do I did my alcohol wash, but it had a high mite count. Uh, the colony was already in collapse. They had uh, sack brood and a lot of other problems going on. And so in that particular video, I show you the conditions of the brood. And also I showed you how to do that wash. And I didn't care that I was killing the bees because the colony was going to be dismantled anyway and was going to be euthanized if they did not get themselves under control when it came to uh, the brood. You know, the nurse bees are the ones that are spreading that around when it's a brood disease. And uh, it was a problem for that one. So because I needed the results fast, I didn't want to fool around with waiting the several minutes or whatever to do a powdered sugar shake. But powdered sugar shake is my favorite for the reasons that I've already described. And I don't think the numbers are off enough. Now, for those of you who need absolutes, by the way, if you need absolutes all the time, beekeeping might not be for you because there are variables every time you go into your beehive. But if you want to create a consensus or if you've got a student group or if you've got a, you know, a scholastic apiary and you guys want to do some studies and see how things come out, do both. Uh, because if you're doing the alcohol wash anyway, you're killing, you know, 300 bees anyway. And if you add the sugar shake just to make a comparison for accuracy for the count, you didn't kill 300 more to do that. So if you're already an alcohol washer, or if you're a Dawn Ultra free and clear washer, which kills the bees and the mites so that you can count them, uh, then add the sugar shake. See for yourself, is that consistent? So for each colony that you're doing, if you're already doing alcohol washes, do them both. Because a lot of people will say, powdered sugar is less accurate. And you go, oh, how many powdered sugar uh, shake tests have you done? None, I just heard that it was less accurate, so I tell everybody else that it's also less accurate. Well, let's prove it out, because backyard beekeeping gives us time and opportunity to test both. And I think you might be surprised that it's not that big a difference. So if it's done right, yes, I would trust the sugar shake as my test for mite loads. <clears throat> Good enough for state inspection. Good enough for me. Next question, number two, comes from Robin from Lancaster, Ohio. Do you have any experience with the on the spot, which is also known as OTS, queen rearing system? It's been suggested to me as a way to grow my apiary in a relatively inexpensive way. I've done some research and purchased Don Lamb's book on the subject, but I'm interested in your thoughts. Okay, so here we are, caution. This is just an opinion piece now on the spot queen rearing because this came up uh, with my class at Cornell for 
we had to write papers and, and talk about things. We talked about reproducing hives, right? Reproducing your colony and getting them to make their own queens, which is what on the spot queen rearing does. You get your bees to make their own queen. Uh, so usually this happens when you have a colony of bees that's fully loaded, they have the numbers, and you're getting to the point where you're thinking about splitting them. So there are a couple of things to do. One, if you're going to do the split, you're going to end up with the original colony that has a queen, or you can move the queen with the split, which is the new colony that you're making. So whichever side ends up without a queen, you need the resources there for the bees to make a new queen, or you're going to install another queen of known genetics. So on the spot, queen rearing came up in our discussions, and I was against it. So, and I'll explain why. This is because, and you can look it up, I'm sure there are videos about it. On the spot queen rearing is in the, again, the box that does not have the queen, but has eggs and young larvae. So they select out eggs that are still in the brood frame, and then they take their hive tool usually, and they push out or push down the adjacent cells around that egg to draw attention to it and to provide a bunch of beeswax right there, which now your queenless nurse bees and workers get in there and they start to draw out and they'll start to make a queen cell off of that. As soon as that egg hatches, it gets treated like a queen because it's a worker and any worker has the potential to become a queen. And my thinking on that is I don't like to do that because I think the bees do a better job of recognizing which immediately hatched egg they want to turn into a queen. They smell the pheromones, they get a sense of the genetics, whether it's a closely related one or you know if it's a half sister because again, your queen mated with a bunch of drones. Some of your workers in the hive are from the same drone and the same queen, so those are full sisters. And some are from the queen, but from a different drone, and therefore they're half-sisters. And then there are genetics where if the queen, for example, mated with a closely related drone by mistake, they mate out on the wing at a drone congregation area, but sometimes the genetics are pretty close. And if they are, those don't get treated well by the nurse bees. So this is just food for thought. The bees will pick the eggs that they want. And sometimes when people did on-the-spot queen rearing, which means they selected the egg, they... They tried to control where the bees were going to build it. Oftentimes the bees went ahead and, and produced another queen cell off in another place on that brood frame anyway. So you had to smash the brood around the egg. So you smushed other eggs, you smushed other open larvae because it's rare that you're gonna find a suitable egg that's just there by itself in a cell. So you gotta smash the surrounding cells to do it. Where if you just do what I call a walk away split, everybody calls it that, it's not like I came up with it. Walk away splits. Um, I pull the frames of brood and resources and, of course, pollen and then, of course, a frame of uh, uh, capped honey. And I put that in now a five frame nucleus box. And then the bees decide as soon as those eggs hatch, which one they're going to turn into a queen. And they're good at building it out. So I don't see a huge advantage in smushing up a bunch of brood around a cell that we pick because we think that's a good looking egg uh, compared with what the bees would select and then none of the cells are smashed and all of them get to grow up. Although the argument could be made that if it's in the middle of the field and there's a bunch of eggs everywhere that also those workers are gonna clear the adjacent cells too as they build it up and of course draw the cell out and down. Queen cells are vertical. So, but that's what I would personally do if a friend were sitting down asking me, what would you do? I wanna make another colony. What about on the spot queen rearing? What about just pulling the frames and letting the bees rear their own queen? I say, let the bees do it and they'll likely make a better choice genetically than we will when it comes to deciding which of those cells is going to be turned into after that egg hatches a future queen. So I don't do OTS. And the fun part was that I went over my uh, classmates that were thinking OTS when we talked about all of the other variables of that and there were a lot of uh, people that reinforced yeah and i did the ots and you know they just built other queen cells elsewhere and ignored the one that i selected so less work just to pull them and set them there and then let the bees do it and then you have the same percentage of success in my opinion when it comes to 
whether the bee is successful or a queen, whether the queen flies out, gets mated, comes back, and establishes that colony. So I don't bother with OTS. I'm sure other people have plenty of things to say about it down in the comment section below, and you're welcome to share your experience with that. Just an opinion, see, on that one. Question number three comes from Steve. Santa Clarita, California. I live just north of Los Angeles in an area with Africanized feral colonies. I started beekeeping last year and have two double deep Italian colonies looking to increase to four this year using purchased mated queens. Over the years, we've had one to four feral swarms in our yard per year. There are two feral colonies, each within a quarter mile from my property, and there is also one other beekeeper I know of within two miles that has 10 to 12 colonies of swarms, captures, and cutouts of varying degrees of aggression. I'm wondering if there's anything I could do to increase drone production during swarm season from Italian stock, perhaps the nucleus colonies containing green drone comb and strategic OAV treatments to prevent mite bombs in order to influence the genetics of the feral colonies in my area. Hesitant to waste resources on anything like this, assuming I don't have enough colonies to make a difference, and if I did, and the queens I reared in the coming years would probably be flying farther than the area I could influence on their mating flights. Interested in your thoughts. So here's my thoughts. I don't ever uh, stop the bees from producing drone but he mentioned the green comb that's what this is it's drone comb specifically drone foundation heavy wax acorn company makes it uh, the reason for this is for the people that are doing uh it's a form of pest management when it comes to removing varroa destructor because the cell imprint on the bottom here is sized for drones so the bees do two things with drone sized cells they store honey and resources in them or they of course raised drones, which are the male bees. So, um, and I agree with what Steve is already kind of forecasting here. Your impact on that environment as described is going to be very low. In other words, flooding them with drones from your colonies, if the colonies are really good and you like your stock, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, your chance of overwhelming uh, the other colonies in the area and where the queens can fly. By the way, how far can a queen fly to mate? So your chances of kind of, you know, generations away cycling back your own genetics is, is very rare unless you're kind of the king of the area when it comes to the number of bees you're running, number of hives. Most people, if you're getting into queen breeding and the ability to impact genetics, most of the books will say that you need 100 colonies, you need drone yards, you need queen finishing yards, and things like that. I think it's an uphill climb, not worth the effort to intentionally try to get your colonies to build more drone comb just to get that out. So there are other ways, by the way. Uh, if you want more drone comb, and, and just naturally up to about 20% of a healthy colony of bees will be drones. Uh, some beekeepers don't like that. They pull the drone comb. Oh, it's drone comb. Get rid of it. Would you use this? No way. It's drone comb. They get rid of that. So we're talking two frames out of ten in a, in a deep ten frame Langstroth box, which can seem like a lot. Another way to get your bees, if you want them to produce drones, but you don't want to push them into it, you can put medium frames into a deep box. Not all of them just a few of them towards the outside. And then what the bees do is they'll draw an attached comb to the bottom of those medium frames. Nine times out of 10, the comb that they draw out down there is now drone comb. Now the good news for, about that is uh, they decided to make their own drone cells there. And so they developed their own drones. And now you have extra comb that you can scrape off for those of you who want to collect the beeswax and refresh it and stuff like that. So it gives you something to harvest. It's also for people that want to control varroa mites a little bit. These activities take a lot of interaction with your bees. So if you're using it for mite control, a lot of people set up drone comb like that green one, thinking they're going to use it for mite control, and then they forget. And then they just basically set up a whole mite breeding ground there and uh, forgot 
to interrupt that progress before your pupating uh, drones emerge from their cells and can now fly and also release those uh, reproduced mites on your colony. So if you're going to do it, better mark your calendar, understand when and when you set it up, when they lay the eggs, when you need to be harvesting that to make sure it doesn't happen. But to flood an area with just a few colonies, a couple of colonies is probably not going to have any measurable impact. Question number four from Jesse in Dallas Center, Iowa. I'm getting back into beekeeping after four years off. I have some drawn comb in mediums from when I last collected honey. It is clean, but quite brittle and dry. Is there any kind of expiration date on drawn comb where you should no longer use it? I like to use it, if possible, as drawn comb uh, and because drawn comb is also at a premium. So yeah, use it. It's true, when you have, uh, especially new beeswax, for example, that just dries out and sit in storage somewhere, and there's no other evidence of damage, or it hasn't been a source of brood disease or anything like that, uh, yeah, it's completely usable, and your bees will go right after it because it's beeswax. And they'll reinforce it, they'll build it back up, it'll become more malleable again, and uh, will be no problem. Absolutely, use it. Question number five comes from David. It says, a uh, question for you. I have six double eight framers here in Eastern Kentucky and I'm happy to report they are looking great. My question is, can you overfeed the bees in winter? I'm currently using Hive Alive fondant and they love the stuff. They're passing up stored honey in supers to munch the fondant. Okay, so this is coming up a few times. Um, we have members in my own bee club that don't want to use the fondant or don't want to put it on early because they think the bees will go to that bypassing their honey resources and just go to the fondant. And my response to that is, what if they did? What if they do? I don't think it's the end of the world at all if your bees end up on the fondant. But the good news for me here is that they, they have consumed part of the fondant. So at different times, depending on what the weather's doing, they seem to be up there feeding on it. But the cluster is down lower. In fact, the cluster is just now getting to my medium boxes. And we did that with thermal scans. So that's really good news. None of my bees have fully consumed any of the fondant packs yet. So my philosophy here is better to have it and not need it. Uh, because if they are up there getting it, what if they get it early? That means there are other resources near the cluster because the cluster is not going to move up into your fondant pack. See? So the cluster, you know, will still be occupying frames down below. So if they're consuming resources, we're just talking. We're just shooting the breeze on this. If they're consuming your fondant resources up above too early and then they back back down to the cluster, which is now over honey reserves that they've not yet consumed then they're in a good position to consume the honey reserves, which is where they're starting to brood up this time of year already. So I see it as a bonus, as an additive. Now, am I putting Hive Life Fondant on all of my hives? No. So which hives have it? <clears throat> all of my standard Langstroth hives have Hive Alive Fondant on the top. And... Uh, this is what it looks like. So we can talk about the fondant just for a minute here. Everybody saw it. If you were at Hive Life, then uh, by the way, the makers of this were there. Everybody was posing with them. So many commercial beekeepers, sideliners, and everyone else uh, were using these and they all had great stories about it. But uh, this is what it looks like. Here's your fondant pack. So it sits on there. Now, also last week, somebody mentioned that uh, the bees got up into the feeder shim area. They were over the top of the fondant pack. And so people were asking, how do you get uh, your bees out of this so that you can move on? And what if the, if the bees are on the top of it, what's the problem? It's really not a problem because your bees are not going to build comb in the wintertime up inside that feeder shim. Even though there's space for it and on a warmer uh, season, warmer time of the year, you do have to do something to close that up in the feeder area because they would start to build feral comb up there. Burr comb, we often refer to that as, or just comb that's outside of the frames, which is where we want them to put their comb. But if they were on the top of it and then your only hole is in the bottom, 
uh, you can just take a really sharp knife and cut a couple of slits. It doesn't have to be very many, and you don't have to cut it open and peel it back. You just cut a few slits, and the bees that are tooling around on top will crawl right through those slits. And then because it stays kind of closed, it's not a real venting area for the warm air from down below. The other thing is your feeder shim, hopefully, uh, is insulated on top as well. So there's an insulated inner cover. There's the fondant on top of that. And then above that, hopefully people have leafed some insulation in there and they've got a polystyrene or some other kind of insulated cover on that. So even if they get up in here, there's no airflow through here because I don't vent. Now, if you do, then you'll have more to watch and to see what happens. But I found that by just cutting a few slits in there, the bees are very good at finding that opening and forcing themselves right back down into the hive through it, where otherwise they seem to be tooling around up in the top there. The other thing is, uh, like right now, it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit out there, which is zero Celsius. Uh, the bees are down below, insulated cover. This little hole spot right here is about 10 degrees warmer. So the heat is coming up and just heating that plastic surface there. So if you cut little slits there, this area up here is a little bit warmer than the rest, but the back side of the fondant is not. The fondant's warm right along the line where the bees are consuming it. You also get to see condensation on the inside where they've cleaned it up. And so that helps the bees metabolize it. Because other criticisms have come out that, well, the bees need water if they're going to metabolize any of the solids. So fondant or sugar or sugar bricks and things like that but the condensation demonstrates that they have access to water right there in the dining room. So I don't see that as a problem at all. And those are just some things that we can solve that, but <clears throat> do I think you can overfeed? So in other words, will they overeat? Would your bees get too fat? No, really it's a matter of economy. So uh, if we were talking now and you're a sideliner and you're really trying to, you're trying to meet a budget, then if you've already saved a bunch of honey on your colony, enough to get your bees through winter, then adding a bunch of fondant and then replacing the fondant and feeding them more of it while they leave their honey stores behind uh, might not be economically very sound. But if you're a backyard beekeeper and one of those packs costs about five bucks, what do you care? Because that's my point. I have more of it than I need because I over forecast what my bees would consume because each of them has about 47 pounds of honey and my horizontal hives have more than that. So I will say this, I don't have any fondant feed on my nucleus hives, none of the nukes, even the little ones don't have it. My long Langstroth hive has no supplemental feed on at all. So no hive alive on that. My observation hives, we have three of them now, they're all humming away. No hive alive fondant on those either. No supplemental feeding. So they're all dependent upon the honey that they kept and stored going into winter. And we're monitoring that. So in other words, if I see that they reach the top and they look like they could be now consuming whatever reserves they might have had as far as honey stores, capped honey, then would I provide some kind of feed? Well, it depends on when that's going to happen. If that happens in the second week of March, then I'm probably going to let them go out and forage for what they need. So everybody's looking good right now. All those hives without the fondant are humming along nicely. Their clusters are a good size thermally. So when we look at that, the image of the cluster is big, but that's the surface heat signature of the box that they're in. But historically, I know that when I've seen tiny heat signatures, that's a tiny cluster, usually in a corner, and it's almost always the eastern corner of the uh, hive box that that happens in, and those are in trouble. All of them are nice, even well-centered uh, thermal signature. So I have high hopes for them. Um, but can you overfeed? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's a problem at all. And uh, it's fun because last winter, uh, the downside was that you came into spring with a whole bunch of surplus honey and the bees weren't using it. Why? Because they bring in new honey in spring and they ignore what they've stored in the past. So now you can pull that off. Uh, then, of course, for the people that uh, send in questions that I talked about earlier, if you're going to make a split or something like that, 
pulling frames of honey in spring left over from the previous winter for colonies that did not consume it that are now strong enough to get new resources from the environment and they're bringing in pollen which is going to be kind of the first thing you're going to see coming in and they're getting nectar and everything those of you who have broodminder scales and things like that will see your colonies gaining weight then you can use those leftover resources in spring instead of harvesting it uh, to feed and build new colonies for those of you who want to expand or you can save it as an open feeding uh, resource or you can harvest it unless it's crystallized or solidified. Question number six. <clears throat> this comes from Jed from Northeast Mississippi. This spring I'm going to have two resource hives. Since they could swarm a lot, I would like to know the greatest distance they can be from my bee yard. I live in a rural area, but I've already had my bees swarm into my neighbor's shed. He didn't care, but I don't want to worry about this. I have started clearing for another bee yard. My question is, if I need to get a frame of brood from one of my resource hives, how much time do you think I would have to move them without harming them. My resource hives will be in the new bee yard, say about 10 minutes away. I know I could move my hives that are close to my house, but uh, would like to keep a few nearby. Thanks. Okay, so this is about <clears throat> moving your frames full of brood, for example, and hopefully they've got bees on them too when you're moving them. And let's say we've got another hive set up somewhere else. This is so easy, by the way. I'm gonna, of course, mention a product. So some people don't like it when I promote a beekeeping product that costs a lot of money. So those of you who don't like that will need to go and get coffee or tea or hot chocolate or something, because this is what I do. If I, for example, uh, want to take apart an entire beehive and I want to get rid of the old equipment, but I wanna move all these parts to uh, a hive somewhere else that's already established or has gotten started and I know that they're queenless for example so I want to combine the two right uh, what I do is I move them with the hive butler tote and if you don't know what that is it's a big deep food grade plastic tote that's designed to accommodate Langstroth size frames the deep frames even with a space beneath them so that even if you're pulling frames that have queen cells on them and by the way if you do that how you manage these frames will be critical because you don't know at what stage of development that queen is pupating in that cell, what stage they're at and how durable they are. So you have to treat them very careful and you have to very carefully put them in. There's no slamming of frames, shoving frames, slamming lids and stuff like that. Treat them like they're little bombs that could go off. Just very carefully slide them in there. And what I do is I put them in the Hive Butler tote. So you know what's cool about that? The interior surfaces of that are so smooth, the bees stay on the frames. It is super easy. This is also how I, for example, set up observation hives. So this spring, I'll be setting up the observation hive that I had made by HorizontalBees.com. HorizontalBees.com. Uh, it was at the Hive Life conference. For those of you who went in there, when you first walked in, it was on the right. It's big. It's got four frames, four deep frames high and three deep. So it's going to do extremely well. But how do you populate that? When you set that up and it's inside your house or whatever building you're putting it in, it's going in my Way to Be Academy building. Uh, this is how I set up all of my observation hives. I get a Hive Butler tote. I go to the colony that I want to do my walk away split from that I talked about earlier. So I pull out broods of fr uh, frames of brood, two of them, shake a bunch of bees in there, nurse bees, because the resident colony's got a big advantage. They're going to do okay, assuming that it's a big, strong colony to begin with. And then I put frames of resources in there and I keep them all together because in transit, they're going to keep each other warm and they're going to continue to feed open brood, for example. They're going to be feeding them. So depending on why you're doing it or how you're transporting or what's going on, it is a great way to temporarily contain frames of bees. And they have two different types of lids for those totes. One is a screened one because it's designed actually for collecting swarms. So it's a good tool for that. I use the Colorado BVAC now when I collect swarms most often, but the Hive Butler totes are great for that too. And I'll explain why.
sometimes you go to get us warm and it's a little branch hanging out from a tree and there's something about the size of a, I don't know, a football. So it's not a huge swarm, it's little, and there's this little tree just dangling right at eye level, ripe for the picking. What I do is I take a Hive Butler tote, and I put four deep frames in it to one side because it holds 10. I clip the whole branch, and I put the whole branch right inside the tote, and then I put the lid on, and the lid is the one with the screen top. It closes up so well, I put that right in the back of my car, and I transport them home. It is the easiest way to transport frames. <clears throat> now, back to this question. The reason it works so well is they stay on the frames. How long can it be in that? Well, you have a car with a heater in it, so you're not worried about chilling the brood. That's the biggest concern. Brood that's young, brood that's new, that needs the attention of nurse bees, needs to be insulated and protected from sudden thermal uh, changes, the cold being the most detrimental. Uh, as soon as you put that lid on there, and by the way, when it's a small a uh, series of frames, three or four frames or something like that, you don't put the screen top in. You just put the regular solid Hive Butler tote lid on that. And people are thinking, what? They won't be able to breathe very well. But if you wiggle that tote around, you're going to find out. There's airflow. These things are not airtight. So this is one by itself. This isn't stacking them. And the lids are loose. And if you're really concerned about that, you could drill a tiny hole in it. But it helps them retain warmth because they're going to generate heat in there your car is going to be warm. But the second part that I want to mention, and this doesn't matter if you're putting them in a standard bee box or if you're putting them in a tote or something else that you've made yourself. Because in the past, I took um, big Rubbermaid totes and I used metal studs for building metal houses, metal walls. And uh, I screwed those to the side walls of the tote and then they were perfectly spaced for my um, Langstroth frames, and then they would rest on those galvanized steel, what would be studs in a house. But uh, instead, they're just screwed to the sides of that tote, and then they sit on there. And then a problem I had with that was the way the Hive Butler totes are set up, each frame has its own slot. So in other words, they can't slide around, they can't move, which is why it would work to clip off a branch, drop it in there, and then the frames stay put where they are. But uh, where the tote that I made that I used to pull in a wagon, um, they could slide or shift and then fall down. So when you make your own, make sure to have some kind of stops to keep those frames from shifting in there when you're putting your deep frames in. But the thing is, when you put them in your car, make sure that your frames are parallel with your direction. In other words, your frames should be parallel with the sides of your car so that when you have to hit your brakes and stuff, there's no frame slap going on. So in other words, if we turn them sideways and now they're broad face to the front of your car, every time you hit your brakes, your frames would clap against each other. But once again, they don't do that if they're in the Hive Butler tote because they're spacers. So the frames are apart. So if they clack a little bit, they won't actually contact each other and be smashing bees, which they have the potential to do in a standard Langstroth box. So run them parallel with your direction of travel. So super easy. So I've given you some options there. I highly recommend Hive Butler totes. They were at Hive Alive. They had a great display there. <clears throat> They're expensive. I'm not going to lie to you. But I don't think I'm ever going to wear one out. Now I might be older than you. So I don't think this is equipment that I'm going to be buying again in my lifetime and they're good for swarms. They're good for transferring frames around. They're good for temporary holding while you do a hive inspection. So that's the other thing is we pull frames out and we have little frame racks that sit on the side of your hive and you're hanging them on the outside of the hive. Well, if your queen's on there, if there's other bees on there that you're concerned about getting away, you find that frame that's got your queen on it, hive butler tote. And guess what I set them on? This, I'm sorry, this is another product I'm going to mention. The B Smart Designs Hive Stands are made out of plastic, which makes them very lightweight. Which means that I use them for things other than supporting beehives. I use them as you, you have to put a solid bottom board on it. So a wooden bottom board becomes an integral part of the B Smart Designs Hive Stand. So I put old bottom boards on there and it's a staging area for me. Guess what else it is? Great place to sit. 
So I take one of those, put it next to a hive that I'm inspecting, and I put the hive butler on it. And then while I'm inspecting, I put my frames directly in that. That way the bees remain on the frames. The wind's not blowing at them. Other bees aren't visiting them. They're protected. And guess what? They're far more calm when you do it. And I've shown that in some of my other videos. So if you have to get frames out of the way while you do other stuff, or if you're changing boxes, or you have to swap out a medium super or something that has bees all over it, transfer them into your hive butler, swap out the box, and then move them all back. And now look how easy that was. And you didn't have to put them on the ground. You didn't have to lose your queen potentially. They all stay right there. It's just good all the way around. So how long do you have? 10 minutes? No problem. You could drive an hour. Why? Because the resources and the bees are on the frames. They're going to make it. They're going to take care of them. They're going to be just fine. So it's a great way to transport your bees. <clears throat> and there's no other product I know of that's on the market that's like that at all. Question number seven, moving on. Christopher Smith. I need your advice regarding a long horizontal hive that I built, and but the bees did not survive in it this year. I own four hives. Three are insulated double Langstroths with large full frames similar to the Lands hive. The fourth hive is a long Lang I built with 20 plus frames. All four hives were doing well in early October after OA vape treatment, and then out of the blue, the long Lang hive died in late October. It was full of honey, six frames with brood and honey frames. I used double bubble on top, insulated the top cover. I set up the hive to allow hive alive fondant. I thought they were all set and looking into the hive, I did not find a dead queen and very few bees. I have several questions. What do you think happened? Well, we know they're queenless for sure. We know they failed to continue to build up. And we also know that sometimes there are in fact late season swarms that happens. It happened to me. That's why kind of at the end of the year, we really have to be vigilant about what's going on because I almost had the exact same scenario in a horizontal long Langstroth hive that I built. Um, but I knew that they were in trouble because they had other issues. So the mite counts are important to know. And of course, your queen left at the end of the year when they didn't have time to replace her because here's the other part. Look at this. If this happens in like the first week of October, we get these weird warm days and out of the blue, this colony that was just booming as described here. If they, for some reason, decided to swarm and that queen left, you are several days out from them having that replacement queen being capable of flying to a drone congregation area. Now, the good news is that this year we had drones flying very late in the year. So it was very interesting. So the potential for her to mate and make it back is there. But there's always a percentage of queens that fly out to mate that just don't come back from the drone congregation area. There's dragonflies out there that time of year. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of predators out there trying to survive uh, getting ready for winter. So it sounds like on the face of it that the queen was missing, especially because she said she's not there. And this is another thing when there's a dead out and if the bees are all clustered together, I always tell people, pick it apart and look to see if the queen's there because the queen is, you know, what they're all about. They'll be anchored over brood if that is in the colony. And then they'll also, um, you'll find the queen somewhere in the middle and her abdomen will be contracted. So she'll be more difficult to spot, but look for that shiny thorax. And that leads, to, leads me to another topic. This year, the color for queens is red. So if you haven't purchased your queen marking pen yet get the red ones now so that in the spring when you find your queens this year you'll be able to mark the thorax and know where they are easier to spot and then of course you'll know when you're when you're missing one and when it's yours so uh, the other thing is do you think a long lang is a good hive design and uh good for who because <laughs> We've got uh, bees move into horizontal cavities, they move into vertical cavities. And uh, so when they're on their own. Now they naturally in cold climates rise into their food resources as they go through winter. It doesn't mean they can't go horizontal, they can. But um, 
this comes into almost an unlimited discussion point uh, regarding whether or not your honeybees will move laterally over frames, right? So the thinking is, and when I was talking with uh, Jeff Horchoff and Randy McCaffrey, Dirt Rooster, these guys do rip outs, we talk about these continuous frames that they find, and they don't follow any rules, by the way, because part of the discussion that, that we've had when we talk about these long Langstroth hives, we're thinking, oh, what if the frames ran parallel with the long cavity, right? Then the bees wouldn't be leaving the frames, it would just follow a continuous frame all the way back. But that's not reinforced by what uh, Randy and Jeff were finding in cavities where the bees were left to build their comb in any direction that they wanted to. Some of them did run parallel with the floor joists, for example, in a horizontal cavity. And others did not. They, they did, did these curves and they meandered out, but they're arranging everything for efficiency, but the environment plays. So in other words, it's much warmer down there, much colder up here. So what the bees would do could be different. I do know that what's been key for a horizontal hive is what's already described here. Extra insulation on the top and on the cover and uh, make sure that the air doesn't bleed off because what we know they need is a warm capsule to move horizontally because they have to go up and over the frames or they have to go around the ends and their tendency is to stay in the